hi and welcome, it's Jim from Avstar Observatory. I've got quite a bit of things I want to cram into this video. I really don't want it to run over 20 minutes, so there's a lot of good stuff in here. And if you're uh, curious about what's causing all the problems and why we're, we're struggling with so simple things, then maybe this video at the end of it might give you some enlightenment as to what really are we dealing with. So bear with me, I've got some uh, photos of different things that I want to show you. We're talking about mainly what the two important reasons are why you know we're seeing what's happening in Kazakhstan take place. It's over two important key fundamental things. One is food, the other is energy. And we're going to concentrate on those two and try and bring it together at the end so you get a bit of a better idea of why we're struggling with these problems around the world and why they are going to get worse. Uh, from this point on. Before we do, uh, I've got a big thank you to say to a couple of people. Uh, first of all, I apologise. Um, as you guys know, I am a little bit dyslexic uh, when it comes to reading and spelling, as some of you guys all, all, always point out. But that doesn't mean that m my brain capacity isn't um, uh, probably a little bit more advanced in other areas. Uh, you, you probably understand that the more you get to know me or the more videos you watch but big thank you uh, to Kelly um, Sorius I'm apologizing now if I've pronounced your name wrong and John Chapanese you know two superstars as well as Rob as well three superstars that that sorted a bit of funding out for us yesterday that really keeps us going and Philip the other day you know this this is what we need a little bit more of just a few more people coming forward and you know putting a bit of funding up for us here at the observatory we can keep things on we can keep the electric on here and you know um we've got the car mot yesterday and that was largely because a couple of people donated a few books simple as that you know we all work together you know we can do a lot together and if you just look at what we do compared to any other youtube channel i'm hoping that you appreciate we do provide a little bit more of a service than just cherry pick on you know things that are going on around the world like what we're discussing today so i want to in this video show you some of the problems that you know we have at the moment and why we have these problems i mean it would be beautiful wouldn't it if there was an endless source of food for us all at low cost and energy at low cost but you know what we really can achieve these things and hopefully we point out in this video why that is so i just want to um you know uh pick up on where we left off yesterday we was talking about kazakhstan we know why there was protesting it got out of hand you know police officers was killed one of them was horrendously killed he had his head chopped off unbelievable but this is the measures that some desperate people will go to when they have faced with no other solution so Kazakhstan has by large been semi restored um, at the help of the Russian peacekeepers moving in to try and stabilize the situation but you know the people are left now with just three options because you know as a few of you pointed out in the video yesterday you know the order was given from the president acting at the current time to shoot to kill people and that's why you know over 20 protesters have been shot to death and that's just what we've been told then them numbers might be significantly higher but we know that 4,000 people have been arrested under terrorism charges now if you're starving and you're freezing to death if that somehow makes you a terrorist then you know we're all going to be terrorists at some point I, I consider the leader over there to not be directly telling the truth when he said that he thought that the Europeans had invaded his country and there was well-trained militia that had, you know, caused all this upheaval. No, it was it, that was so far from the truth. These were your people, and they weren't happy about the promise that you broke. You promised you would not put the energy prices up, and you did. And this is we're talking one of the wealthiest nations with regards to crude oil on the planet uh, what is going wrong with not just Kazakhstan but the rest of the world that has these rich resources what is going on why 
is it that their people are suffering? It must be because there is too much corruption and there is too many elitists that need to be fed. And these people that were once happy being millionaires, and then there was a race for them to be billionaires, and now there's a race for them to be trillionaires. It will never, ever stop. The greed uh, in the world seems to be never quenched with enough. And because of that, we're going to see a lot more of it take place. And, you know, they are left with just three options. And, you know, these are the options that inevitably are what we are going to be left with because this is not just segregated to Kazakhstan. It is going to be more so in Europe, in the UK, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere around the world is going to be faced with the same problems. And what they're left with, the three options is they can starve to death because they can't get food and it's not freely available or it's unobtainable because it's just too dear or they can freeze to death now because they can't afford to put heating on and therefore they might slip peacefully if it's a blessing into the night whilst they freeze to death and die or they can become a protester and be shot to death What I want you to focus on is what Kazakhstan did. They reached out to other nations to control the population that was protesting. And this is what we all need to take um, note of. Because like there was a deal struck with other nations that if ever upheaval got out of hand, that they would lend a hand to help restore it. And they have restored it very quickly. But there are still people peacefully protesting at the moment and it doesn't mean that the sparks won't ignite there like they did a couple of days ago because this is how it started you know the police started to get a little bit brutal with these protesters you know the protesters wasn't happy with that they got a little bit more feisty with the police ended up with people being shot and killed and as a result the situation hasn't changed for these people they've still got a problem with the cost of fuel LPG in this case and the cost of food yet they are still in a nation that is very rich and has the resources so you know something needs to give some you know um, common ground needs to be established otherwise the situation remains you know those three choices death death and death again death by shot death by freezing death by hunger and this is what is going to happen around the world from now on because the problem is going to continue to exist and what i want to do now in the rest of this video is just go over a couple of issues that we have with energy and what we've been trying to do over the last you know i suppose 100 years in trying to learn more about electricity how to uh, generate it and you know how to produce crops in a bit, little bit more of a um, way which is sustainable and then I think you're going to realise that um, it doesn't even really matter tomorrow if we come up with a mechanism of producing free electricity for each and every one of us even if that technology does exist which I doubt it does because I've spent 25 years researching this as you're going to see some of the different uh, methods of producing electricity some of you won't even have heard of or come across before but there is many ways of skinning the rat there is many ways of producing electricity and um, even to this point and time we don't have at least except for one which i'm going to mention soon to you i'm going to show you the one method that could work and resolve the world's energy needs today if it was um if there was to be more investment invested in that area and you know um the support for it we do have the means to cure at least the energy requirements so let's get into it let's have a look at some of the different ways in which we generate electricity and then we'll talk about one which may be the best method of doing so so with that let's get on with it so let's hit the road running with the most commonest way we uh, generate electricity and that is through a generator 
As you can see, we've got two magnets, north and south, opposing each other, and we have a copper wire rotating in the vicinity of those magnets. And what this does is it sucks in the electrons from the ambient area around us, or some would say it's the ether, but it draws it in, and as a result of going through the fields, it acts like a water pump. In this case, if we're, we're going to use fluid dynamics as the um, way of understanding this, it's pulling the water through um, you know, that gate of north and south and through the stators that you can see uh, at the end of the coil, this is where one end is connected to you know, the one half of the wire and the other end is connected to the electrons will flow through it like water. There's a reason why I use fluid dynamics to explain what's happening with electricity because, you know, all around us is a sea of electrons. We just need to find a way of tapping those electrons or encouraging those electrons to move through um, some copper wire so that we can tap it to light, obviously in this case, the light bulb. But, you know, we do live in a sea, which we can't see uh, with our eyes, of electrons it's and, and this is proved uh, we know that through you know um, uh, turning a generator or a coil of wire in the magnetic vicinity like we're looking at this very basic des uh, design the copper obviously has electrons but the copper wire doesn't shrink so that means that the electrons aren't coming from the copper wire they are like the medium in between the sea of electrons and you know the usable applicable um, use of the electricity uh, probably what I'm trying to do here guys is explain it in such a layman's terms where most of you will understand it um, so you know if we turn a copper winding in the vicinity of a north and south magnetic pole we will draw the electrons from the ambient surroundings through the copper wire and we'll be able to tap those electrons to light the light bulb that's it. That's how we generate the majority of our electric. Uh, wind turbines are utilising the wind to turn the turbine, which is doing the exact same thing as what we've just discussed. It's turning the copper wire in the northern safe poles of a magnet and it's producing the electricity. Solar panels are a little bit different. Uh, they use the uh, silica crystal, which converts the solar light or sunlight as the photons hit it, they are absorbed into that crystal and they produce the electricity. Uh, nuclear power is when you put two radioactive materials together and the reaction you get is heat. So we tap that off uh, in, you know, in a form of steam and we use a steam turbine to turn basically a generator. Um, electrolysis is another way of um, producing energy. We can use electrolysis, we can get a positive and negative off a nine volt battery and put it into two probes into water. What will happen on one electrode, you'll get hydrogen gas form, on the other, you'll get oxygen form. And if you put those two back in the exact same uh, ratios that you take them off, you end up with something called Brown's gas. And you can burn that gas and produce uh, energy you know you could run a petrol generator of hydrogen quite easily um, so uh, we've gone through those so wind turbines solar panels is another way we produce electricity nuclear as you know is another way there are, there are try there are a lot of experiments going on now which are running up to the costs of millions and millions of pounds in fusion technology. I don't think we'll ever see something good come out of that. The best example of fusion technology working only, albeit for less than a minute, is probably what Jet Propulsion Laboratory are doing over at CERN. And, you know, they still can't get it sustainable for a longer period of time than a minute. And the reason why I think that is because they're using the principles of what they believe the sun runs on. Now, they, they believe that the sun is a nuclear reaction taking place under fusion. Uh, but the only problem is with that is that we've never seen the amount of um, neutrinos come off as, a, as part of that reaction taking place. So it must be doing something else. And if you're basing your fusion models on what you believe the sun is working on, 
then it's that case of bad data in, bad data out. And to this day, despite the, the amount of money that they've spent on Fusion, it's never, ever going to work. Um, so there are a couple of other little things that produce electricity. One of them is piezos, and I want to show you that one, what these look like. So what we're looking at here is a piezo uh, crystal, and you probably have seen these in some of those birthday cards when you open them up. Uh, it acts as a speaker. Uh, but if you connect it up to as they, as they have in this little diagram here or this picture you can see he is squeezing the piezo crystal with his thumb and his two fingers and it is charging up the capacitor and lighting the LED so crystals can produce electricity under pressure and another one that does that very well is quartz crystal so what we're looking at here is a spring, a tiny hammer, and you'll find one of these little devices in every electronic cigarette lighter. What happens is the spring, as you push it down, you feel the tension, then it releases that tension, which makes uh, like the hammer hit the tiny bit of crystal. And as it squashes the crystal lattice structure of quartz, it produces electricity and the spark gap means that, you know, if we, we can measure electricity by the spark gap, uh, which is the gap it will jump across. So there's probably about 600 volts in every day cigarette lighters, but it's momentarily and doesn't um, consist of a lot of current. There's a lot of voltage there, but not a lot of current. Um, so, you know, by piezo crystals, quartz crystals, what we've learned, if we, we compress them, we squeeze the electric out of them, and then once that tension is removed or you don't squeeze any more, it absorbs the electrons back out of the ambient sea that's all around us. This is important. This is what it's took me really 25 years to really get my head around is that we do live in an ocean of electricity. It's just, it's like, I suppose, voltage. You know, you get high voltage and at low current is not dangerous but if it's high voltage at high current it will kill you instantly uh, 25,000 volts won't kill you if it's only at you know uh, 1 milliamp but 25,000 volts or sorry a uh, 1,000 volts will kill you if it's at 60 amps or 100 amps so you know we have to remember that the ocean that we live in all these electrons that we live on is at very low amplitude and very low uh, voltage but i will say this you know we do see uh events naturally occurring and this is why we get the uh, schumann resonance uh, because it's a measure of voltage uh, lightning strikes every so often on our planet so on average on our planet the schumann frequency is usually about 7.8 hertz which means every second there is 7.8 lightning strikes taking place somewhere on our earth our earth is producing more electricity in this ocean than what it can contain over its surface area and you know we will talk about this another day um, it's not widely understood what gravity is but i wouldn't be surprised if we find out in the future that gravity is nothing more than charge which is proportionate to surface area and the reason why i think i'm on the right ball with this is because if you compare the surface area of the moon we know that the small body the moon has less gravity than what our earth does our earth has 9.8 meters per second the moon has 1.5 meters per second force of gravity and if you compare the surface area of the earth compared to the surface area of the moon you're going to understand why it simply can't um, ascertain more charge over a smaller surface to have a greater gravity than ours if you compare larger bodies in our planet you'll find that they've got larger gravities because they've got larger surface areas that is gravity it's charge proportionate to surface area that's my theory it's not written or peer-reviewed anywhere that's just my understanding of the things that i've come to learn over these 25 to 30 years of really being interested in science so another way of producing electricity is by squashing crystals and you squirt the electricity out of them when you do that and you know it's not just uh, quartz crystal you use piezo crystals there's a lot of others another form of producing electricity is uh, peltier elements so in this little experiment we see before us um, we've got a peltier element connected to all these wires 
and obviously these wires are connected to the multimeter showing us that there's a charge being produced. What the experiment is set up to do is on the one side, on the left side, is cold water and on the other side is water that's been boiled in a kettle that's been poured in there. And what happens is through uh, thermal displacement uh, in the particular element, so long as one side is kept colder than the one that is hot, it will produce electricity. You find these Peltier elements in these little mini fridge freezers that you can buy. You may have you, uh, noticed that we put about uh, an array of 16 of these together when we was building the cloud generator. Uh, the reason why we was using them is because we was putting a lot of electricity into them to bring the temperature down of the base of the cloud chamber so that when we put the alcohol in there it immediately turned to vapour and we could see cosmic rays leaving their uh, vapour trail as they passed through there. Something we've not completely finished is on the back burner and it will be finished one day uh, but you know if you remember the uh, where we left off was we got water tanks on the one side of the Peltier element that was getting hot because if you put electricity into Peltier elements one side goes freezing cold the other side goes really hot and you have to displace that heat but Peltier elements can be used to generate electricity so long as you keep the other side colder than the one that is being heated. Now, if you had, obviously, people have done this on YouTube, you can see some great experiments where they've built um, little uh, cauldrons. So on the one side, it's being heated by the heat of the fire, and on the other side, they've got water jackets taking the heat away, and they're using the electricity to pump a small pump to do that, and they're producing electricity enough to use. There's a lot of ways which, as you already know, I don't need to show you wind turbines, that we can get pretty much uh, low-cost electricity. So once the initial costs are taken from the building of the wind generator, let's say, or the um, solar panel, we can extract a lot of energy off there. I think Canada has a problem because they've got large solar fields now there. Uh, sorry, not the California, I think it is not Canada, they've got large solar fields and in the summer they generate a colossal amount of energy but they just can't store it uh, unless they are paying Tesla for these uh, storage banks which is just batteries really but another way to do that I think another way of skinning that cat would be to use the excess electricity uh, in a form of electrolysis they may have even already thought about this they might have even been doing this but by using uh, you know diverting that ex excess power into electrolysis you split the water molecule up you end up with hydrogen and oxygen and you store the hydrogen and oxygen to when you want to use it perhaps in the winter when you're not getting as much sun hit those solar panels so we don't just have to store uh, the energy that we capture from some of these devices in batteries we can actually use it to create other methods of storage which can last a lot longer like in hydrogen tanks, oxygen tanks, etc. So, um, yeah, we can generate electricity through uh, hydrolysis. So, I know automatically a few of you will know what you're looking at and what we're going to be talking about next. But before we do, I just want to say in all the methods that we have looked at, there's always been a force that has been able to turn the turbine in order for us to get electricity. So in hydro, um, it's been the water moving from a higher altitude to a lower altitude, passing through the turbine vanes that have turned the generator to produce electricity. Wind turbine, the force that has acted on the turbine to turn uh, the wind generator is the wind itself. Uh, with solar panels, it's the force or the amount of photons that fall on that photo photo uh, voltaic uh, cell and it converts it into electricity um, it, it's the same with everything so there's always a source now the thing is we need a more reliable source than wind or a more reliable force than wind to turn the turbines because wind drops off the turbine stops you know it, solar panels the sun stops shining as it does every day for us no electricity is produced um, hydro is only good as long as you've got a regular amount of water passing through 
uh, vicinity but then there is any amount that you can tap off there isn't many places in our world that could you know uh, fulfill the um, necessary demand for electricity just on one of these uh, alone but there is one other source which can produce electricity both day and night and could go for thousands and thousands of years and produce all the necessary energy we could ever ever want and that is what we're looking at now these are geothermal generators in the core of our earth is a pretty much i, I don't like using the word perpetual motion but there is a perpetual amount let's say of heat that certainly hasn't cooled down in the last millions and millions of years and if we drill down two kilometers into the earth's crust or even deeper we can inject water into there and turn that water into steam we can use that steam to turn the turbine now we're looking at a flash steam power plant here and the only difference between an ordinary steam power plant and a flash steam power plant is the actual pressure and heat of that water i think it superheats the water the flash uh, in the flash tank cools down to turn the turbine and then in turn turns the generator so if you went really deep you'd probably end up with a flash uh, steam power plant and the only problem is with these is yes there are plenty of um, locations on our earth where we could drop these on uh, and mainly those places would be fault lines and you already know don't you I don't need to say yes like fracking they can cause earthquakes and have caused earthquakes uh, geothermal generating stations have caused earthquakes in the past alarming earthquakes but I think if we was to move them offshore on the fault lines and then tap that geothermal energy we wouldn't have a problem with resolving the world's energy crisis and it would be more reliable than um, solar panels it'd be more reliable than uh, wind turbines which is really what where our governments are injecting the majority of the money for renewable energy we've got a hot core in our earth that hasn't been tapped for its potential energy and it is enormous but the only thing that's putting people off is that these geothermal stations are usually put on fault lines on land and you know they cause earthquakes in the local vicinities it's not a good idea it's like fracking has been proved to do the same thing that's why it's it's almost frowned upon but there is if we go offshore and do this i'm sure we can do it if we go offshore and we tap the geothermal vents on the fault lines let's look no further than the ring of fire or other places i mean we've got you know we've got geothermal vents even here in the uk if we uh, go to london there's an old roman spa even the romans uh, utilized and understood the benefits of this you know water coming out the ground at 40 degrees fahrenheit without having to heat it up by fire it naturally comes out the ground and these geothermal vents are found all over the world but if we start tapping them and start injecting water down into them we are inevitably going to cause earthquakes but why not do it offshore why not do it offshore maybe it would be safer i don't know would it cause tsunamis would that be the thing that put people off we just don't know but we've got this source or this it's not just a source of heat but we've got a force that we could tap for the electricity that we need and it would definitely quench every demand for electricity on our planet but we're just not putting enough um, research and uh, development into that source but it would be more reliable than wind it would be more reliable than um, solar panels and probably even at the end cheaper so I hope I've given you a bit of an idea of to how we create the problem, um, how we resolve probably some of the problems with what we're facing at the moment. But right now, we are not we're not utilising this, and as a result, we are going to be in ever energy poverty, just like those in Kazakhstan are right now. And you know, 
as well as I know that you know we will be sharing those free um, options that they're left with starve to death freeze to death or be shot for protesting unless we find an alternative I have invested 25 years guys in the understanding of how electricity is produced where it comes from and to this point in time you know the only method I could if I was asked to ever uh, give someone that could probably be more sustaining than anything else would be geothermal energy um, because it's clean um, okay it can be potentially hazardous with regards to producing these geothermal stations on land uh, with localized communities because you can cause earthquakes that's the problem um, but maybe um, if we was to go deeper looking look into this a little bit further you know put more money into this technology we could find out probably a safer way of obtaining the same thing and um, without causing those um, effects that we see it does now um, with regards to the food crisis we said we was going to split this video up into two things with regards to the food crisis the only thing we can do at the moment until it becomes outlawed and it will if we we start producing electricity on a great scale if some magic device tomorrow turns up on the market you'll be taxed for using it or you'll be banned from using it and we've seen some of these stupid laws come out as people have mentioned in some states in america you're not allowed to even collect the rainwater this is ridiculous it's like you know they're trying to outlaw burning wood and coal in, in the united kingdom right now and they will in other places around the world you know they're keeping us utilizing their friends uh facilities and they're waxing themselves rich as a as a way of means of doing that and you know people like in kazakhstan in europe in the United Kingdom, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, we're all being forced to use something at an extreme cost. It doesn't need to be that way. The, the resources, I've always said this, are here and free for us all to use, and it's our birthright. It isn't just because you have managed to obtain millions and billions in your account that you are then able to dictate how the rest of us live. Now, I'd love to say one thing to these billionaires like bill gates is f off you psychopathic mf i'm sure you can fill in the gaps because how is it that just because you've got more money in the bank that you seem to feel you know now how the rest of us should live on this planet you know just keep your money shut your face and get on with your life and leave us to get on with ours and don't make it any harder you know because your ideas are stupid oh, I, I've got a bit of an issue with Bill Gates I won't go into it too much but you know what someone that predicts a pandemic is going to come about and then invests in com biological or virological companies that can produce vaccines um, just is a little bit too coincidental for me I think you, you know if we do start looking deeper we'll find out that he was involved in what's took place recently and um, that's a subject for another day but this is why really and largely we're facing the problems that we are in this world you know the magic box that produces all the energy for us doesn't exist we haven't learned how to tap the reservoir of electricity all around us there is lots of ideas on the internet if you want to waste your time like i have over the last 25 years actually putting them to the test you find that they don't work simple reason is is you need a free source of force to then turn that generator and we've got a couple but they're not very reliable we've got wind which can drop off at any point we've got sun which we know when the sun sets it no longer is there and you know we've got a couple of other things that don't necessarily produce a lot of um, energy for us because you know in order for us to get the energy that we need like electrolysis the splitting of the water molecule into h2o so we can burn the hydrogen with the oxygen again requires energy to be put in 
it's like the ambient electricity that is around us requires some form of work to be done in order to draw it out of the ambient into that copper coil and then through the status of your generator you can then tap it to run your electrical equipment we just haven't found the means to this point in time in order to do that but we do have some other sources where we can tap that force and utilize it and i, I always think um, you know geothermal uh, generation of electricity is an endless source it will run 24 hours a day guaranteed but there are the risks involved just like i suppose every other um, method that we've got so far so i hope you enjoyed the video today i probably didn't and unlike i normally do didn't get through all these uh, um, bullet points uh, i just want to actually i'm just looking at this one now i just want to say this you know china has a maize stockpile of 62 percent of the world's maize and i just want to leave you with that question why do you think that is why is china stockpiling the majority of the world's maize and it's not just maize that's just one of the um crops or products that they're or, or you know uh, agricultural uh, gains that they're, they're, they're stockpiling probably doing that with wheat and a lot of other are they do they know something we don't know you know are they aware that the world is going to run short on food at some point or are they preparing for a war because that's another reason why you'd stockpile food you'd want to keep your armies uh fed as they continue to you know cause and wreak havoc on the world just putting that out there as a you know an interesting sadistic you know we are struggling as we go further into this glacial period as the magnetic poles reverse and affect the climate you know we are struggling to find land that we can grow crops on and you know we've got countries like china already taking advantage of that guys i know it's probably been a bit of a difficult get through on this video we've talked about lots of different things um you know this is a video i wanted to do for a while so uh, again big thank you to kelly john rob and i let me encourage a few more of you to come through and you know uh, support us with a bit of um donation uh, the link's down there in the description i'll say what i usually do guys it's been emotional as always take care of your loved ones bye for now